And it truly did. I invite you, please, to take your Bible and go into the New Testament to the most detailed account of the events of the birth of our Savior in Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2 is where we will be this morning as we begin this series of messages, Finding Christmas. Luke chapter number 2. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word if you're able to stand? And I would like for us to read these 20 verses responsively. That is, I'll read verse 1 and then we'll read collectively verse 2. We'll alternate her back and forth, me reading the odd verses, you and I both reading the even verses down through verse number 20. So we're in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1 reads, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift. Paul called it an unspeakable gift, a gift that I am quite inadequate to explain or understand, a gift that was only given because you loved us, because you cared for us because you did not want us to perish in our own sins without any opportunity of salvation, without any hope beyond this world. And so I thank you this morning for your gift. That gift was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He was laid in a manger. He would grow up as a boy. He'd become a man, a mighty teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, but most of all, he would be our Savior. 
the one who would die in our stead, who would take our sins in his own body on the tree, he would suffer and die so that we might live and live eternally. And so, Father, today we're grateful for Jesus. We're grateful for this season of the year, the opportunity we have to gather around your word this morning. Oh, Spirit of the living God, would you take your word today and use it as a scaffold in our hearts to help us to realize what we have in and through you? Would you today draw the sinner here without Christ to repentance and faith? Will you honor yourself? and your son. We ask it in his name and for his sake we pray it all. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. In verse number eight, we're told that the angels appeared to these shepherds who were watching their flock by night. Now I know and understand that that word night primarily speaks of the hour of the day. I know that that word night speaks of the fact that the sun had gone down in the land of Israel and it was dark outside. But, but I also believe that that word night has some very symbolic meaning. See, if you and I had been living in that day, th that night was a night of darkness, politically speaking. The Israelites were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. They, they really couldn't make their decisions. As a matter of fact, if you know anything at all about the gospel accounts of the Lord Jesus Christ's life, you know, when it came to wanting to kill him, they could not kill him without the authority of the Romans. Politically, it was very dark for the nation of Israel. Morally, it was a dark age. And the Romans were perverted in their practices. They were quite evil in their intentions. But, but the reality is that that sin was very prevalent in the land of Israel. And they too were participating in the things that their culture had brought them, that Roman paganistic culture. It was a dark night, morally speaking. It was a dark night, spiritually speaking. When we come to this account of the birth of our Lord Jesus it's been over 400 years since there's been a prophet in Israel. It's been over 400 years since God had sent to his own people, a nation, a, a messenger to bring hope and to bring uh, the help of God into their lives. It was a very, very, very dark night. And against that backdrop, we have burst onto the scene an announcement of the birth of the Christ child. I cannot imagine what it must have been like for those shepherds. I've been to some shepherd's fields outside of Bethlehem in Israel, and I've tried to picture what it must have been like to have been keeping your sheep when suddenly the sky lit, <laughs> the angels descended, one of them began to speak and before it was over, the entire host of them would begin to sing glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It must have been a unbelievable night they come with a very simple message 
The message is verse 10, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's interesting to me that as soon as the angels left, verse 15 says, they began to say to each other, let us go now even to Bethlehem. And look at verse 16, if you would, please, because verse 16 really is our text for this entire series of messages. It says, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, the word that's translated found there in our, our English language it is a Greek word that implied to all of those in that day and hour that there was a search and then they found. These men have left their place of occupation in the fields outside of Bethlehem. And they have made their way into the little town of Bethlehem and they begin to search where? Not in a mansion, not in a palace. They begin looking for a manger, a feeding trough. I don't think it's an accident by any stretch of the imagination that God announced it to shepherds because shepherds were much more likely to know where the mangers were than anybody else was. And they began to go, not, not house to house, not, not mansion to mansion, not to the palace. They began to go from one stable to another stable to another stable. We, we don't know how long they went. We don't know how many stables they went to. Oh, I know, I know. And in our picture perfect mind, because it's Christmas, they went to the right one the first time. And they may have. I don't know. I wasn't there. Anybody there? Okay. <laughs> but, but I know this. They went in search of what they had been told and they found, I love that word, they found the lovely Lord Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, Christmas is a season of the year where a lot of people are trying to find a lot of things. They're trying to find a little peace, a little comfort, a little love, a little acceptance. They're, they're trying to find the subject of our, our message today, joy. But, but they go to all the wrong places. They're, they're searching in the mansions. They're searching in the palaces. They're, they're, they're looking for maybe something if, 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 if they could just get a newer car or a newer house or a newer whatever. I mean, surely that would bring what they're looking for. If they had just a new position. They're not satisfied where they work or what they do for a living. Maybe if they could get a new pleasure, that something that would, would just give them a, 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 some satisfaction in life. It would just bring some joy overflowing. But, but the reality is true and genuine joy is not found in a place, a possession, a pleasure, position, power, whatever you want to say. It's only found in a person. True and genuine joy is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful account that Luke gives us. Because it not only tells us that they went on a search and found, but you know what they did once they had found? They wanted to help others find. 
It says they went out and they told all the things that they had seen and heard. Verse 20 says they went out and they glorified and praised God. They were, they were witnessing and worshiping because they found, they found the Christ child. What an example for every one of us this Christmas season. To know that we can find what we're looking for in and along through Jesus Christ. And once we have found him, we can share him. We can share him with others. And so over these next several weeks, I'm going to talk about different subjects that people are looking for and, and show us the answers found in and along through the person of Jesus Christ. Today's subject is finding joy. Let me give you a definition of joy. Joy is the inner peace of God when all around us is dark and dismal. Joy is the inner peace of God when all around us is dark and dismal. I think you'd have to admit this morning that we live just like these shepherds lived in a dark day. It's dark in our nation politically. We're more divided, in my opinion, than maybe we've ever been in our 245 plus years of history. It is a dark day morally. We, we, we are, by and large, a culture and a society without a moral anchor. Everybody's doing what's right in his or her own eyes. It is dark spiritually. Now this morning, while there are places where the Bible will be preached and taught across this land, uh, may I say to you this morning, there's not enough of those places, uh, not enough of those points of light. It's a dark day. But I'm glad that in the midst of the darkness, when everything is dark and dismal, I'm glad that you and I can personally know the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, joy is one of those prominent themes. We talked about joy to the world a few moments ago. Uh, we were out, I said, last night at the Christmas light at Planters Walk. And at least on one occasion, I think on two occasions, if I'm, my memory is correct, we, we saw the word joy lit up in light. And uh, of course, we had our grandchildren with us. So uh, three of our grandchildren, their mother's name is Joy. So that's what they'd say. See my mama's name? I say, yeah, I do. And uh, Nana and I gave her that name. That's the only reason she has that name. So we wanted to make her famous and uh, put her name out. All right. <laughs> Joy. As a matter of fact, you know one of the ways we greet each other? We, we greet each other this season of the year with the two words, Merry Christmas. You know what the word Merry means? It means a state of joy. Merriment. We, we understand that, that joy is one of those things that while people are searching for it in so many ways, they, they just don't seem to quite find it. But, but I want you to notice verse 10 with me, please. There in Luke chapter 2. Verse 10, the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of, what's those next two words? Great joy. And the wonderful thing he says, which shall be to all people. In other words, great joy is available to everyone. Good tidings. That's, that's one word. As a matter of fact, one word in the Greek language here is translated into four words into our English language. It is the four words, I bring good tidings. It is the Greek word evangelion. It's the word that we get our word evangelism or evangel or evangelize or evangelistic from. It's the, it's the greatest of the good tidings that Jesus Christ was born to become like us, to become our sacrifice, to make available to us his own righteousness and salvation. It is the basis of, of finding and knowing real joy. See, if you want a joy that's unshakable when it's dark and dismal, then you have to find that joy in one who's unchangeable. And so this morning, I want you to look at a few verses here in this text as we see three facts concerning the Christ of Christmas while we think about finding joy. First of all, I want you to notice with me, please, the arrival 
of the Son. In verse 12, it says, And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's a birth announcement. It's an announcement of the birth of the Son of God in Bethlehem. You know, really, most birth announcements get very little attention. We, we might stick a stork out in the front yard, or we might put a flag on the mailbox, and, and we might have a few family or friends that rejoice because we have a son or a daughter. But, 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 but by and large, there, most people don't pay attention to births. Births are pretty much an everyday happening. Somebody's being born right now while you and I are talking. While I'm, I'm talking, I hope you're not talking. Uh, while I'm talking, <laughs> and uh, while we're sitting here, it's just something that goes on and on and on. You know, maybe we ought to give a little more attention to births. You know, when the world was focused on Napoleon Bonaparte in 1809, they were wondering if he was going to conquer the world. Do you know that same year, William Gladstone, who would maybe be the greatest prime minister in England's history, was born? That, that same year, one of the greatest poets who ever graced the world was born, Alfred Lloyd Tennyson. Uh, that same year, a couple other literary noteworthy figures, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, Wendell is named after Wendell, but don't tell nobody because we say it right, Wendell, all right? And uh, you can always tell when people are transplanted this part of the world, they're going to Wendell. Uh, no, 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 you're going to Wendell, okay? He was born. Charles Darwin was born that same year. There's a little boy, little baby boy, born in a log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. His name was Abraham Lincoln. We don't pay a whole lot of attention to the announcements of a, of a newborn, but what, what we're reading here in Luke chapter 2 is the announcement of the greatest birth that's ever taken place on planet Earth. Jesus the Son of God has been made flesh. I love the way John 1, 14 say it, says it, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Where many people may have just seen a baby, it was God. And, and even in his birth, isn't it interesting? His death is demonstrated. You, you know what swaddling clothes are? One of, the, one of the uses of swaddling clothes in the day of the Lord Jesus was for bandages. It, it, even in the moment of his coming into the world, it was foretold and spoken through symbolism that he had come to die. Jesus, the Son of God, became the earthly son of an earthly mother. He came to be one of us so that he might understand us, or at least that, he might, that we might understand that he understands us. He already knew what was in the world. But he came as a child so you and I could understand that he is not just a savior and a sacrifice, but he is a sympathetic high priest. You, you know, I've been told, and I'm, I'm not very musical at all, but I, I've been told that if there are two pianos in one room, that when you strike a key on the piano, that on the other piano, that same note is struck and vibrates softly. They call it sympathetic resonance. Well, it's, that's exactly what happened with the arrival of the sun. What, what happened with the arrival of the sun is God showed us that he has sympathetic resonance toward us. He understands our hurts. He understands our sorrows. He understands our cares. As a matter of fact, the, the writer of Hebrews would write about the Lord Jesus. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So you and I can find joy today, true, everlasting, genuine joy today. 
because of the arrival of the Son. But it's not just the arrival of the Son. Secondly, this good news of great joy is the appearing of the Savior. In verse 11 is the only time in all the New Testament where you find in one verse the word Savior, Christ, and Lord. We'll we'll look at Christ and Lord in a moment. But you find all three words, Savior, Christ, and Lord. So, So the angel said in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. That that word Savior means deliverer. Remember, they were in a dark day, politically, morally, spiritually. They they were in a day of defeat. They they were in a day of depression. They were in a day where where everything around them was dismal. But but he says, "I, I want you to know that today in the city of David, there's been born a Savior, one who can deliver you and not just deliver you from temporary death, not just to deliver you from temporary defeat, not just to deliver you from temporary despair, not just to deliver you from temporary darkness, but, but one who can, can deliver you from eternal death, from eternal destruction, from eternal damnation, from eternal defeat. There's one born today in the city of David, which is a Savior. Isaiah had foretold him so many times. And yet there's a couple of statements that the Lord makes in the prophecy of Isaiah that bring great joy to my heart. One of them is found in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah in verse number 11 where where God says, I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Then a little bit later in chapter 49 and verse 26, the latter part of that verse, this is what the Lord says. He says, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. You know what's interesting? The word Savior or salvation, the noun, or the verb saved in some form is found in every book of the New Testament. Why? Because the story of Jesus is the story of a Savior. See, we, 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 we don't all today share the same heritage when it comes to family. You, your, your family may have come from Germany. Mine came from France. Yours may have come from Spain. You may have come, you know, it's like you heard about the little boy went to his daddy and he said, Daddy, he said, I, I got a question. He said, okay, son, what you got? He said, I want to know where I came from. Oh, Daddy said, oh, man, I knew this day was going to come. He didn't say it out loud. He's just thinking, now, how do I explain to this, that my little boy, where he came from? And he said he tried his best he could to explain it to him on his eight-year-old level. And he said, well, Daddy, I don't know about all that. But Tommy said he came from Dayton, Ohio. Where did I come from? <laughs> you know? we, 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 we may not have commonality and in in economic situations, family situations. But you know what? One thing we have is a common thread through all of us. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the one thing we everyone need is a Savior. That's our commonality. We all need a Savior. That word saved means to make safe or secure. You know, I'm glad that in and through Jesus Christ, we can be made safe from the penalty of sin. I'm glad that we can be being made safe from the power of sin. And and I'm glad one day we'll be made safe from the very presence of sin. No wonder the angel said to Joseph, and she shall bring forth a son. and Thou shalt call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah is the Savior or Jehovah saves. <laughs> you know, you and I have a Savior. Now, it's up to us whether he becomes to us a personal Savior. God sent him to save you, sir. 
God sent him to save you, ma'am, young adult. God sent him to save you, teenager. God sent him to save you. But it's up to you whether you put your faith and trust in him and allow him to be your personal savior. You know why he sent a savior? Because we could never save ourselves. We're sinners. And thereby disqualified from saving ourselves. You know, that, that's what mankind has sought to do ever since man sinned in the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve one prohibition. He told them they could eat of every tree that they wanted to eat in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. You will surely die, not just talking about physical death, but a spiritual separation from God. Your relationship with God will be severed in the moment that you eat thereof. And it was. You don't have to go, but just a couple of verses later in the account there in Genesis chapter three, verse number six says, and she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, the tree desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and her father gave it to her husband also with her, and he did eat. And then you just have to go a couple verses later in verse eight, God comes down to the cool of the day and he says, wherefore art thou, Adam? Where are you? Where you at, Adam? Why? Because they'd been separated. That, that relationship had been severed. But you know what? You just go a few verses later. Chapter three and verse 15 of Genesis. And God says, I'm going to send you someone who can save you. Someone who can deliver you. Someone who can make you safe and secure. But ever since that day, you know what we've been trying to do as men and women and young people? We've been trying to make our own salvation. I, in the context of what I've just accounted there in Genesis chapter 3, you get down toward the end of the chapter and you know what Adam and Eve did? They sewed fig leaves together. They thought they'd cover their self, their sin. You go to the next chapter, chapter four. They, they, have, they have two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel brings an offering of his, of his flock, a blood offering, which I believe by that point, God's already taught Adam that that's the kind of offering he would accept. But, but Cain, you know what he does? Cain brings a fruit of his hands. He, he, he brings something, he works up because man, man wants to see if he can just somehow salvage himself. Somehow save himself, somehow redeem himself, somehow reconcile himself to God. But can I just say to all of us this morning, that is absolutely impossible because you and I are sinners and we need a savior. That same prophet Isaiah I mentioned a couple of times already in chapter 64 and verse number six says, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The best we can do is putrefy to God's holiness. So, so you have the, the arrival of the son, you, you have the appearance of the, of the savior. But, but, but there's one more source of joy that is the authority of the sovereign. Look there with me, if you will, in verse, 12, in verse 11 again. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It was not just the birth of God's Son. It was not just the birth of our Savior, but it was the birth of the sovereign. As God becomes flesh... He is Christ the Lord. Th those two words are distinct and, and truly have two different meanings. Christ is the messianic title. Christ is a reminder that the one God promised beginning in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 has arrived. Christ speaks of his reign and rule eventually over all the nation of Israel, but ultimately the whole earth. That's messianic. Lord is a term that speaks of the fact that he's master. He's the owner. As a matter of fact, the most used terminology speaking about God in all the Bible is the word Lord. In the Old Testament, the word Jehovah. In the New Testament, the word uh, Adonai. It's used over 7,900 times in over 6,700 verses. He's our Lord. And just to think, the infinite one became an infant. Just to think, 
the unlimited one took on limits, made himself of no reputation, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, and took upon himself the form of of a servant being made in the likeness of man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But you know where real, real joy is found? Real joy is not just found in knowing him as your Savior. Real joy is found in submitting to him as your Lord. You know, when we come to Christ, we admit that he's Lord. That's what it says in Romans chapter 10. In verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. When a person comes to faith in Christ, that they admit, I no longer want to be in charge of my own life. I have made a total mess of it. (laughs) But I come to you, Lord. And I turn my life over to you. That's where salvation begins. But may I say to you, that once that salvation has happened in our life and we've been born again, there's a process then known as sanctification. And, and as we are sanctified, we submit more and more and more and more and more to his lordship. Oh, some days we struggle and we take back part. Some days we, we decide that he can't rule this part. He can't have this thing. But can I tell you this morning that Jesus Christ alone is worthy of our love and our lives. We should do more than just worship and adore him as a babe in a manger, though I'm glad that he became flesh and dwelt among us. We should serve him and submit to him. That's a real pathway of joy. Real joy is found not just in trusting him as Savior, but serving him as Lord. Yes, this morning, there are good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. How? Pastor, how could joy be made available to all people? Number one, he's the son, and we can relate to him through the new birth. Number two, he is the savior, and we can receive him by faith. Number three, he is the sovereign, and we can respond to him in obedience. All this morning, there is joy, real joy, true joy found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So I don't know where you've looked. I don't know what you've tried but I know where you can find real joy. You can find it in Jesus. If you don't know him today, he wants you to know him. If you do know him today, can I just say to you, the way you found joy is the way you maintain joy. I know him as Savior. Do you submit to him as Lord? Is he your master or just your Messiah? Let's bow our heads for prayer, please.